right? What did I say? Becoming like Jesus. All right. Now, the first thing, special position. Let me say special position. And we just read that uh, from James and John, the son of Zebedee. They wanted Jesus to look over all the other ten disciples and let one of them sit on the right and the other one on the left. Even though they did not count up the cost, what it really took for them to do that. They just assume that that would be a prestige position and they wanted to sit one on the right and one on the left. Yes, sir. And Jesus was letting them know that they didn't know what they was asking. Because he said, can you drink of the cup that I drink of? He was talking about the cup of death. He's not indeed, you're going to drink of that cup. You're going to drink of that cup, but do you, are you prepared to drink of that cup? And then he said the other 10 got, it, got sort of upset. And I saw it. He said, really, they was upset. Because who do they think they are that they can ask for a position like this? And we've been here too, and we're not asking for no special position. But they allowed uh, the, the selfishness. The selfishness, they allowed that. And when you have self-centered, people want everything self-centered around them. It'll cause people at time to quarrel over worldly ambitions yes, instead of following Jesus in the path that he followed. There's a lot of folk want to name the big names and want to be say, I know this person and I know that person and I can get this and I can get that. But it really doesn't matter a lot if you are a disciple. A disciple is one that can be trained and one that uh, is trained of Jesus. And they do not desire to just be uh, over something that they don't know about. Now, the first thing I said they wanted was what? Special, Special positions. positions. All right? The second thing that would keep a person to hinder, uh, Jesus, that hindered Jesus' disciple from becoming like him was that they quarreled over scriptures. Mm. Matthew 22, and uh, verse, starting at verse 23, 22 and 23, through verse 33. Now, let's see how they quarreled over scriptures. Verse 22, 23. Behold, I'll make sure I got this right now. Matthew's, I'm still in Mark. Um, Matthew 22 and verse number 23. I'm right. Just didn't seem like I was reading like I wanted to read, but I am. All right, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name. I'm Matthew's instead of that. I'm there again. Matthew's. 20, oh, 22, I was in 23. Uh, 22 and verse 23. Let's try this again and see what happened. All right, 23. The same day, okay, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which said uh, that there is no resurrection, and said to him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother should marry his wife and raise up seeds unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and had no issues, left his wife unto his brother. 26, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seven. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall uh, she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scripture, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection there is neither marriage nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they was astounded at his doctrine, or astonished at his doctrine. Now, 
So the second thing that the disciples did that kept them from being like Jesus, they quarreled over the scriptures. When you are teaching, uh, the scriptures are not a time for debate. They're not be, the scripture was never made for debate. The scripture was made to be turned to train people and to learn them, but not to argue about scriptures. Not to say, well, this is what this said, and this is what that said, and how can that be? Okay, that always caused confusion. And so Jesus said to them, say, you, you, you know, you're quarreling over scriptures. He said, but you don't really understand when you're talking about whose wife is going to be. He said, in heaven, uh, it's not when, uh, in the resurrection, there's not going to be no marriage, nor given in marriage. But Jesus had already told them, but they didn't hear what it was going to be in heaven. So that's why he said you error for not knowing the scripture. And I'm pretty sure somebody else has maybe asked that question. You know, what are we going to be like? There's people that think when you die and go to heaven, you're going to have wings like an angel. You're not. There's no scripture. They show you that on television and stuff, but there's no scripture that says you're going to be like an angel. Now, here's what the scripture did say in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. It tells you, uh, uh, gives you an idea. Uh, it didn't actually tell you what you were going to be, but it gave you an idea of what you were supposed to be. All right, do you have it? Yeah. Amen. Beloved, now are we what? Y'all see that? When are we sons of God? Now. And it does not what? Yes. It does not yet appear what? Yes. What we shall be. But we know what? When he shall we know that what? When he, when he shall appear, we shall what? Be like For we shall see him as what? He is. he is. All right. Did he appear to them while he was on earth? After the resurrection? What did he look like? Not exactly like himself because they couldn't identify him. In a glorified body. So he said, so you're arguing over something. Jesus was telling them, you're arguing over something that don't make any sense. And, 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 and in our classes, don't go to class to argue. Teach the lesson. That's what the disciples were arguing about. They was quarreling over scriptures. So as long as you're quarreling over scriptures, that means that you're never going to get into the image of Christ. Because Christ did not quarrel over scriptures. He didn't argue about scriptures. He taught the word. And that's what God wants us to do. That a time, we, a time is so short that we ought to be so glad to teach God's word that we don't have time to quarrel. We don't have time to debate. But we, we need to redeem the time. This is the second thing that held Jesus' disciples that, that, that they were not confirming to his image. Now, the third thing that held them back is found in Matthew 16 and 16. All right, Matthew 16 and 16. And the third thing is, the disciples did not understand clearly who Jesus was. Do we really know him? Do we really know him? Or have we just heard of him? Or we think we know him? But do we really know him? All right, now notice what Jesus said to them in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the what? Christ, the son of the what? And verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou what? Simon bar Jonah, son of John, jo uh, Jonah, for what? Flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my what? Father, Father which is in heaven. Now, were Peter the only one there that Jesus asked, whom do men say that I, the son of man, is? Some of the others did answer. And they said, some say you're John the Baptist and, you know, rose resurrected. Some said you what? A prophet. Some said you are what? Elias or one of the other prophets. But Jesus said to them, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Now, if we was asked a question, you was asked a direct question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? The son of the living God. Now, they had it on the news this evening. Where that, did anybody see that where this man was debating 
with the with the preacher uh, that had the museum that was telling you about the creation. The sci and this scientist was saying that the earth had to be older than 600 years old because this is that. The man didn't say the earth was just 600 years old. He was telling about the creation. 6,000 years old, thank you. He was telling about the creation. Now, if you would understand the Pentateuch and take the Pentateuch, you understand that before, he didn't say the earth was created then. Because when we start reading, God just told us in the beginning, in the beginning, he didn't tell us when the beginning was. He said in the beginning. But this scientist thought he could argue and said, we know that this older than this. We know that that, that has to be. But when they got through, everybody still had the same opinion. The people that believe in science were on his side. And the people that believe God was on their side. So it wasn't nothing changed. But, you know, one thing that God's opinion holds up much better, I think, the scriptures do, if you got any kind of mind. If somebody told you, that there was a one cell amoeba that started the whole thing. Now, they wasn't there. What did it look like? Where did it come from? How could it multiply? How did it get life in the first place? Now, they got to answer all them questions. All we have to say is in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But Jesus said to them, and look at verse uh, 22, in the same chapter, verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Why did Peter rebuke him? Because Peter, again, the disciple did not know who he was. What did he rebuke him for? Look at verse uh, uh, 20, 19. Let's go read on down to it. And I will give unto thee, what? The keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever, whatsoever thou shalt what? Bind on earth shall be what? Bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt what? Loose on earth shall be what? Now, he gave Peter all that, that credit, and then he charged his disciples that they should not tell no man he was Jesus the Christ. Don't tell nobody I'm Jesus the Christ. Now, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into, unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and strive and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now, he told telling them this. Now, Peter just said he was the Christ. Now, if Peter had really known that he was the Christ, he would understand that he came to give his life for them and for us. But watch what Peter said. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, But it is far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So he was saying, he rebuking Jesus for saying what he was. If he had known truly then who he was, he knew he had to die. He knew he had to die. And look what Jesus said. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now, he had to rebuke Peter. He just praised Peter. And then he had to turn around and rebuke him. Now, it's the same thing. We got people that can preach you so happy. But in some small things in the Bible, they don't know. They don't know him. They, they believe that God can heal a headache, but you tell them that God heals somebody from cancer, they have a problem with that. No, I don't think he's doing that now. You know, they, they, they may have thought they were really sick, but they, they, weren't, they weren't as sick as they said they were because, you know, you can't be no food. If the cancer is in a fourth state, God ain't going to heal them from that. And they just preach it, and they preach God can do anything but fail. All right, now let's look at another scripture here, showing you how that the disciples did not understand clearly who Jesus was. Let's look at Ephesians 3 and 17. 3 and 17. Let's see what uh, is going on in Ephesians 3, 17. Ephesians 3, 17. You have to say amen. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17. All right. That the God of what? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the what? Am I, got, um, am I in Ephesians? 3.17. All right, let me get it here then. Let not your heart be troubled. Ephesians 3.17. All right, now we have it. All right, that the Christ may do what? 
Dwell in your hearts by what? Faith. That ye may what? Be rooted and grounded in love. All right. So if Christ is in your heart, that's the foundation. That's the thing that have to grow. But it only grows through the word of God. If you are distorted in any way, the word of God, it can throw you off all the way. That's why he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And that's why you hear me say it so many times that make sure you understand the word. Because if you don't understand the word, or even if you misuse the word, it can throw off a whole paragraph. Your sentence, if your first sentence is wrong, then your paragraph is going to be wrong. If your paragraph is wrong, then the story is going to be wrong. And so you need to make sure that out of all you're getting, you get what? And understand. And understand. So number three, the disciples did not understand clearly who Jesus was. Number four, St. John chapter three. St. John chapter three. And let's look at uh, verse, uh, verses three, verse three. We've got a few other verses we're going to look at in this. But number, number four, they did not believe who they were to be as Jesus' disciples. He made them disciples, but they didn't have a clue of what they were supposed to do as disciples. Do that sound like... Anything that anybody get a job in church and don't know what they're supposed to do? Yeah. They in everybody lane but the one you put them in. Yes, well, look what John says. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be what? He cannot see what? So what, did, what, what do you think Jesus was saying? And what is the reason then that the disciples did not understand clearly who Jesus was? They had to be born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. And there's a lot of folks in our church that have position, but they have not even born again. Amen. They're not. Amen. All you do is have to listen to them talk. Amen. You listen to them talk. And that was a problem. That they, how can you become like something you are not and you don't know nothing about? How can you tell somebody, please help me. I need some help. It's impossible to do it. But yet you have people's holding. How many of you have really heard uh, people's on the job telling you they was a deacon? And they curse and do everything that all, they do everything, but they're a deacon in their church. And, you know, they'd be the first one to tell you, well, ain't nobody perfect. Ain't nobody perfect, and uh, I'm not trying to be perfect. But look at what 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23 says. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 23. What does it say? 1 Peter chapter 2. I did. But chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 23. Got it? 2, 23. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23. What did it say? Who, when, he was Who, when what? When he was reviled. When he was reviled. Reviled not again. Not reviled not again. When he what? When he suffered. He did what? He, 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 he threatened he not, yes. but did what? Committed. But committed himself to him that judge righteously. righteously. And that word T-H is on judges. Continually. So if you are born again and you believe that Jesus have died, you're not causing a lot of trouble. You're not causing a lot of trouble because he said, note what he said here, who, when he was what? What do the word revile mean? When he was insulted, when people said things that they shouldn't say to him, what did he do? He did not revile again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to what? Him that continued to judge righteously. There is a character if you are a disciple of Jesus. Your characteristic is the character of Jesus. You can't go around cursing folks out. 
<laughs> so, these are things that kept the disciples. Because when Peter was revived, what did Peter do? He cut the man ear off. When they pushed him, he cursed. That's what kept him from growing into what? The image of Christ. Number five. St. John, chapter 20. St. John, chapter 20. And we're going to look at, in John, chapter 20, we're going to look at exactly what we're going to, we, we're going to be talking about. That's verse 19. This is number five. The disciples did not know what was available to them to help them as children of God. Wow. The disciples did not know what was available to them to help them as children of God. Do we know our rewards? Do we know what God has in store for us for being his disciples? Sometimes we think that we are the least of all. We're going to receive nothing because God loves us. And I've been working for him a long time. He never did this for me. Look like the sinners got more than we have. And what you don't even think about, when you look at the lottery, and, 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 and one, of the best, one of the best commercials for the, the lottery, for the big lottery, what do they call that one that won it? The power, that's right. Yeah, somebody play that. <laughs> okay. All right, so, yeah. One of the... <laughs> now, one of the biggest, the best, best commercial they have, but people don't even see it, is they have a man laying down with white balls falling all around him. So it just looked like snow. And then all of a sudden, that one little red ball, out of all them white balls and everything around him, that one little red ball is falling. And they tell you, it pops up there and says, it's now $300 million. Okay. Only one red ball. When they give you $300 million, ladies and gentlemen, they have taken in 30, 30, 30, what I want to say, uh, 30, 30 hundred million dollars, if, if I'm not saying it. So they're only giving you the tithe. And then the government tax you on the 300 million you won. And you end up so happy because you take home 153 million. But, you know, you, the average person would be glad to take home one. But, they show you your art. But the Bible says that the blessings of God make us rich and add no sorrows with them. Now, look at verse 19, what it says. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, there the disciples was a symbol for fear of the Jews, came to Jesus and stood in the midst, and said unto the, he said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whosoever, whatso, whosoever sin ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sin ye retain, they are retained unto them. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see him, I see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my fingers in the print of the nail, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, and his disciples was within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. 
Then Thomas, uh, then he said he to Thomas, reach hither thy fingers, and behold my hand. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And he, and be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto Thomas, because thou have seen me, thou have believed. Blessed are they that what? Have not seen and what? And many other signs fully, many other signs truly Jesus, uh, many other signs truly did Jesus and the what? Present of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now they didn't know what they were going to get, but they, they did, if they'd have known who they were serving, and he showed them that he was, had died and that he was the same one. He, he said, look at my hand. The, the nail prints are still there. The hole is there. Look at my side. This, you can put your hand. This is living proof. And you are wondering and worrying about what we're going to get for serving you. My God, they, they didn't know what was available to them. And Jesus said, all things are mine. He had told them that all things are mine and everything that's mine, I've already given it to you. So now he said, he was telling them about your faith. How much of faith do you have in God? How many believe that God really going to take care of you? That real God really going to take care of you? I mean, you have to believe that because God going to make you prove that statement. Amen. He is. He's going to put you in a position where you're going to have to prove that you, what you say is what you believe. There's a lot of folks say a whole lot of things, but when they're under pressure, they, won't, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. But pressure will reveal who you are. A diamond don't look like a diamond when, until it's under pressure for a million years, they say. Now, it starts out as a piece of coal, but pressure brings out what it is. Now, some of you probably have not seen real coal except unless charcoal. That's not real coal. That's charcoal. That's process. But real coal have all the, you can see the elements of some of the dirt in it. You can see some of the, the lead, everything in it. We used to, when I was back home and our heaters, the old stove, they would take and put a log on, and when the log got hot, they put coal in, and it would burn the coal. The coal would burn much longer and, 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 br and brighter. And, but the real coal, they would bring it in by the ton. My dad used to buy it by the ton. We had what they called a coal house, and we kept it in there, and that's what kept the fire going. They cooked with it and everything. So, but that coal, that is the coal that took and formed from the sedimentaries of rocks and all of the breeze and stuff around it until it was black. But when the pressure is on the coal long enough, all the blackness leave, and it becomes a diamond. It forms a crystal that is so hard it cannot be broken. It can only be cut. The way you tell a diamond, you can't break a diamond. It'd have to be cut. A zirconian cubian, you can break it in many pieces. It'd look like a diamond, but they, you hit it, it's gone. Somebody don't believe it, bring me one of yours. No, that's all. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's, a, that's how you tell them apart. A diamond you can't break under pressure. It'd have to be cut. And that's what God molds us into. We are God's juror. You should be mine, God said. And you should know that under pressure you don't break. You don't break under pressure when you uh, know what your rights are and you know what God's going to do for you. You just don't break under pressure. The disciples did not know what was available to them to help them as children of God. My God. How many don't know who God is? How many don't know what God has really done for them and can't realize that we're better off the way we are? Now, it's not that God has withheld, uh, withheld anything from us. He hasn't withheld, withheld anything from us. All good things God wants us to have. But what we have to understand, when we know God, we have to know the principles of God, how to receive. If you don't know how to receive, you won't get it. Absolutely, you won't get it. It doesn't mean that God don't want you to have it, but you won't receive it if you don't know how to get it. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to know how to get it. He wants you to, he wants you to have it, but he wants you to know how to get it. And if you don't know how to get it, God ain't going to give it to you. And that's the truth. Now, you can miss your privilege. And, and, and the story is told that a man was coming from England to the United States by ship. And he bought his tickets. He got on the ship, and they gave him his cabin. He went in his cabin. He didn't have any money, and he didn't have no food. He stayed in there for a week until he just couldn't stay, take it anymore. He was so hungry. He, came, he called one of the stewards and said to them, 
are there any work that I can do for food? I won't, I, I'm starving. I haven't ate in six, I haven't eaten anything for these last six days. I've been in, in my thing. I don't have any money. And the man said, you didn't eat nothing. He said, I haven't eaten anything. He said, read your ticket. He said, all your food and everything was provided in the ticket. And you were in the cabinet by yourself starving. So a lot of things God have already provided for us, but we don't read the ticket. This is the ticket. Read the ticket and see what God has promised you. And then believe it by faith. Everything from God is by faith. Everything. What did I say? Everything. Now, I got to show you. That's so good. Me, I don't have to deviate from the lesson here. But let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, and I believe about verse 3. All right, I'm saying Colossians, but uh, First Thessalonians, let's try that. No, no, Ephesians. Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 4, 5 and 6. Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 4, 5 and 6. You ready? Verse 4 said what? According, According as he did what? Chosen us what? When did he do it? When did he do it? That we should be what? We should be holy and what? Before him in love. Now, when did God choose us? Before the foundation of the world. He made a choice. You're not here tonight because it's an accident. You're here because God knew you would be here and predestined you to be here before you was born. Before you was born. Now watch this. Verse 5. Having what? Predestinates us unto what? The adoption of children by Jesus Christ to what? According to his what? Of his what? To be what? Praises of God of what? Read it. He made us to be accepted in the what? Beloved. And what is the beloved? Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, think about this. I want you to understand what this says. This, this scripture says that God adopted us. Do you know if you're adopted into a royal family, Everything that the royal family have, you're a part of it. You're a part of it. Adoption means to, the word, uh, what is that, the word? Uh, um, we are see, we are see, which is lad, child, in Greek. When God adopted us, we got the same privilege that Jesus had. He made us a part of the family. A part of the family. Now, did Jesus ever, ever beg bread? Huh? Was Jesus ever found hungry anywhere? No, sir. Was he ever found naked or destitute? No, sir. Wait a minute. And we must be serving something different then. <laughs> because if Jesus were not like that, then why do we feel that we're going to be like that? Huh? How, how, how do we, why do we feel that we're going to be left out? We're going to be not having anything because God don't love us. Uh, he loves everybody else, but he don't love us. And so therefore, we just can't make it in this world. And we can't make it because God really doesn't care about us. Who told you that? Where did, where did that lie come from? Who could have ever told you that? Who, how, how could you even have, have, have ever thought in that, I feel that way, that you are left out and, and there's nothing you can do about it and, and you just left out. Mm -hmm. Now, 1 Peter, I mean 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 3. Watch this. 1 Peter, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. 1 and 3. 
2 Peter 1 and 3. And we just start reading at the first verse. Simon Peter, a what? All right, now, you know what this word servant means? A slave. Doulos. A, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have what? Obtain like precious faith with us through the what? Righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So not only Peter, but all of those that have gained faith. Now look at verse 2. Grace and peace be what? Multiplied. All right, now, wait a minute. Now, we're talking about what we have, what we don't have. It said grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor and what else? Peace. What is peace? Absent of confusion. Be what? Multiplied. Didn't say added, but what? Multiplied. I want you all to get it right now. Multiplied unto what? Unto you through the what? Whoa, whoa. My God, that's what stops us. That's what gets us. It's through the knowledge of God. If we don't have the knowledge of God, we can live like a poor person and, and, and live like we don't have nothing because we don't have knowledge. My people perish not because God don't want you to have it, but lack of knowledge. Through the knowledge of God. So you can be in church 20 years and don't have no knowledge of God. You go, hey, child, I just can barely make it. Don't have no knowledge of God. That's what it is. Genosco, to know. Don't know what, you, what God had promised you. Didn't get it. And that word genosco is two, two Greek words for, it's actually several, for the word knowledge or know. You got Genosto, which means you have been through it, you investigate it, and you know it completely. And there, there's the word uh, Ido, E-I-D-O, Ido. And that word Ido says you may not know absolutely, but you do know a portion. You've been exposed to it. Now, you're being exposed to the word of God tonight. Are you going to be the one that is just the idol, you're exposed to it, and then you know, and you, have, you don't know it absolutely, but you do know it? Or are you going to seek to be Genosco, that you really know God's word, you really have tried it, and you know when you tell somebody something that God said, God will do it? Which one of the knows you want to know? <laughs> Genosco. Now, 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 watch this. So, Notice what it says here. We, we continue to read. He said, uh, peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. And Jesus, what? Our Lord. Our Lord. Now, according as what? Divine power. Right, oh, stop right there. Divine power. When we use the word divine, what do that word say? Divine is what? Not natural. Spiritual. Through the divine what? Power. According to the divine power, dunamis. Have given us what? All, All things that pertain to. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I want you to get Janosko in this. What? Are you giving us all things that pertain to life? What? Somebody please highlight out some things that we need to live on. Just need to live. Money, he's hollered out first thing. Water, food, clothing, houses. Not quite everything, most of it. But, but, but those are things that we know we need. But he said he what? Have already what? All things pertaining. Now if he's given us, why we don't have it? <laughs> uh, now, now, okay, well, we better read this again because maybe we don't misunderstand this. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How did he do it? Through the what? Through the knowledge of him that hath what? Called us to this glory and virtue. Now look at verse 4. Whereby are given what? Exceedingly great and precious promises that by these ye might be what? Of Having corruption that is in the world through lust. That's what he's telling you. So when the disciples, the, the disciples did, did not know what was available to them to help them as children of God. 
Do you know what's available to you? Somebody ought to mark that strip you down. Because it's available to you. Number six. Ephesians 1 and 18. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. When you get to say amen. They did not understand that they were not saved for their own comfort. They didn't know they were just not saved for their own comfort. They were not saved. That's where the people make their mistake. Say, well, I'm saved. They don't want to go out to witness. They don't want to, they don't want to do any of those things. They don't want to come to church. They, they're saved. Say, I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven. And that's all I want to do. Just say, I barely make it in. The disciples didn't know that. That's what they were thinking too. But what do verse 18 say? The eyes of our what? Be what? That we may what? What is the hope of his calling? And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance? What? In the saints. Verse 19. And what is the what? Exceeding greatness of his power. To us what? Who believe according to what? The working of his what? Which is what? Is wrought in Christ when he raised him from the what? And set him at his what? On right hand in the what? Far above all what? And powers and what? Might and dominion. And every name that is what? Name. Not only in the world but also in that which? And have put what? All things under his and gave him to be what? The head over all things to the church, which is the what? The body, the fullness that fulfilled us all. He is in us. The devil should be on our feet. And we should know that God did not give us all this power, the power that exceeds everything, the power that is above everything. Then the devil is under our feet. He did not give us this power to warm a pew, and he didn't give it to us to be comfortable. When the disciples got comfortable in Jerusalem after they got the Holy Ghost, he sent habit. I wish I had one person say amen. amen. He sent habit to get them out of there because it's not a comfort zone. He got them out. And this is sometimes why we have the trouble. Because we've gotten comfortable just with our name on the book. And the disciples didn't understand that they was not saved for their own comfort. Mark chapter 10. St. Mark chapter 10. And let's look at verse 45. Chapter 10 and verse 45. What did Jesus say? Mark 10 and 45. What did it say? For even the what? The Son of Man came not to be what? Served but to what? Serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come to be served. Matter of fact, he told his disciples, I don't call you servants. He served them. He washed their feet. He fed them. He didn't come to be served. And that's what sometimes the people in the church, they think everybody's supposed to serve them. Go see my uncle. He's sick. You ain't went seeing nobody. When your uncle is sick, he's the only somebody sick every day. So a lot of folks, everybody in here got somebody sick. Y'all ain't gonna say amen, but is anybody out here don't have nobody sick? You see, you got a family large enough, somebody's sick. We can just look around tonight. There's a lot of folks that are not here tonight because they're sick. Now that's not for everybody. But Jesus didn't come to be served. And they had to understand that's what hindered them from becoming like Jesus. And number seven, we need to own up to our responsibility. That's what we need to do. We need to own up to our responsibility, what we are supposed to do. The Bible says you should know the what and what would the truth do. 
It'll make you free. We've got to stop procrastinating. Because these are the things that hinder the disciples from becoming in his, like him in his image. They couldn't come because they had all of these hang-ups. All of these hang-ups. Do you know if it's hindered the disciples? It hindered us also. Now, unless you read church history, Josephus, or some of the other apostles, uh, uh, the historian, we don't know. In, in the Bible, it didn't give us a record of what happened to all the apostles. We only know that Peter was killed, James' brother was killed, Paul was killed, but it didn't tell us in the Bible when Andrew was killed. Huh? Did anybody find when Andrew was killed? Did it tell us when Bartholomew was killed? These were disciples. He didn't tell us that. He didn't even tell us when John was killed. He did tell us he was on the island of Patmos, but he didn't tell us when he was killed. But they died. They died. And how is it that these men all died in the faith? And how is it that after they died, the word of God was never distorted? You know why? If you own up to the, whole, to the thing is, the only way that our children that's coming behind us is going to know how to treat their neighbor and how to live for God, we got to tell them right. and we got to teach them. Yeah. And my God is sort of scary because the statistic right now among Christians, we used to be 62 thirds of the world were Christians. Now, that was counted in the Catholicism, Catholics. Now, one-third of Christians believe that there's errors in the Bible. The same number now of Christians believe that homosexuality is not a violation of God's word. Do we have a God that we would die for? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, rose again on the third day, and is in heaven with God and sent the Holy Spirit back to be with us to guide and direct us? Is that Jesus worth dying for? And it's easy to say, because Peter said it. But when the pressure was on, Peter cursed, and he denied him. You would be surprised how many people sitting in our congregation and in these small and largest church, church churches got five or 50,000 people in them. If somebody came in there and said, we're going to start killing everybody today to say they're a Christian, line up, and we're going to shoot you. And would their religion be worth dying for? Would they die? Or would they deny Christ and say, well, I was just didn't want to, you know, I'm just want to live a little bit longer, you know, and I just, I can repent. <laughs> but see, all of this has already been tested, but he that forget history is destined to repeat it. This is what happened in the three, in the third century when the Catholics was killing everybody and the Arabs was killing people that said they was a Christian. And not only that, if they didn't kill them, if they made that, they, first they started with the preachers. They killed the pastors because they said, we killed the head, we'll stop their body. And so they took every, all somebody had to do was accuse you of being a Christian. They would confiscate your house, all of your material, and put you in prison or kill you. They did that for about 100 years. That's why Fox had the books of Fox Books of Martyr. You read that, and they killed them. They fed them, they had sports with them. They fed them to the lounge. They were taking a man and put him a uh, time to one horse, one run, going one way and a horse going the other way and pull his body in the sunder. They would put him out to fight lounge and bears for the arena. All of those things. But they would not. They would not deny that Jesus was Lord. They killed them because Caesar would say, they would come and they would see him on the street and they, they saw that they was Christian. They said, Caesar is Lord. They said, no, Jesus is Lord. 
and for saying Jesus is Lord, they would be killed. They, the Christian was persecuted on every side. Socially, they was persecuted. Because when, they, when we get this word holy roller for, the Christian had to have their services in the night and hide. And so when they, was, they were doing that, they said they was holy rollers. And they, they said they were doing something secret, secret meeting. And then when they would give the communion, and they said, this is my body, this is my body, they said they were cannibalistic. All of these things Christian went through, and they died. And now we are not dying for nothing. And we, are, we still don't want to honor him. We're scared to honor him and afraid to do it. And then, you know what? They, they decided there's no need for us to keep killing them and persecuting them because the more we kill them, the more they multiply. So they keep multiplying. They keep multiplying. And then, when Constantine defeated and came in and he said that no longer can you kill Christians, a person for being a Christian, and he was a Christian, and he said, no longer can you kill them. Give them back all the property they've taken, everything back. Took it from the heathen, took it from those people. And then, guess what? Some of the people, he gave the Christian powers, and some of the people that were not Christian went out, and they made Christian out of people. And people, they said, if you're not a Christian, we're going to cut your throat up. And they, they said they was Christian. You had a whole church full of hypocrites. They did. All of this is church history. Our church full of hypocrites. Seems like we somebody pushing knives around a lot of folks just next in our churches. <laughs> but that's what they did. So do we have a God? We ought to just fess up. If we want to be like Christ, then let's act like him. But if we don't want to be like him, let's don't stay in mom and grandma and fight each other and don't believe the scriptures and so have select the scriptures. I believe this, but I don't believe that. Uh, arguing about scriptures all the time about, you know, just making, just making Sunday morning a time to argue, uh, whenever you meet a time to argue. That's not what it's supposed to be. Somebody ought to teach it and you ought to believe it and you ought to read it, read it before you get there so you know what you're talking about. Amen. Nothing shows a person ignorant more than you show you a fool. When somebody has been to school and got a PhD in a field of medicine, science, knowledge there, you ain't went around the corner. And they start teaching you and you tell me, I don't believe it. I don't think you know what you're talking about. You don't know everything because you got a PhD. They don't know everything, but that, that if a person have articulated in a specific, specific field and you've read 30, 40, or 50 books about it and got all this information and you haven't read a sentence and get up and say, well, you, I, I don't believe it. Now you know you're making yourself a fool. You're looking like a fool. And that's what Abraham Lincoln said. Better to remain silent and thought a fool than open your mouth and remove every doubt. Stand your feet, everybody. <laughs>